So um, I'm more of a practical NMR spectroscopist rather than a um, very technical methods person. Uh, so that's kind of how I aimed my talk. Um, I also hope that we can have kind of a back and forth discussion if anyone has any questions about uh, practically how to do this. Uh, but I'm really excited because I, I, I really like this. I know a lot of people are uh, solids uh, here, but hopefully I can convert you to the dark side of solution. Um, so my talk is broken up into two parts. Uh, the first part is just the basics of using uh, methyls and solution in MR. Uh, and then there's a break for questions. And then the second part is more practical applications of using methyl probes from my own research, uh, solving a structure, doing chemical shift mapping of large protein-protein complexes, and then measuring dynamics that are important to biomolecular function. So I think probably everyone here already knows this, but just to recap, studying high molecular weight species by solution in MR is super, super difficult. Uh, and this is because large proteins exhibit very slow molecular tumbling uh, and large T2 relax relaxation rates leading to fast decay of your NMR signals. Uh, and practically this results in broadened NMR line widths, poor signal to noise and low spectral resolution leading to a traditional solution and a more molecular weight limit of about 30 kilodaltons. Uh, and if you look at one dimensional amide proton spectra for proteins of different molecular weights, you can see when you go from eight kilodaltons to 24 kilodaltons, you've already reduced your spectral uh, sensitivity and line widths by quite a lot, making it really difficult to do anything for proteins above the size and solution uh, by traditional methods. So over the last two decades, there's been a lot of energy into uh, advancing uh, and overcoming these traditional methods, uh, these traditional um, uh, size limits, first in hardware. So there's been new high-filled NMR magnets, such as the 1.2 gigahertz uh, magnet commercially available by Bruker these days, and new cryogenic NMR probes that allow for signal enhancement. There's also been advances in isotopic labeling schemes and commercial precursor availability. Deuteration and methyl side chains are the most popular of these. And then new NMR methodologies and pulse sequence, for example, amide and methyl trozy, fast pulse NMR, and non-uniform sampling. And we'll only talk about a subset of these as they relate to methyls today. So why are methyl groups so great for solution NMR? Well, first they occur in hydrophobic cores and on interaction surfaces, which makes them great for mechanistic studies. Uh, methyl protons don't readily exchange with the solvent, unlike for amides. So this reduces the line broadening that you would get from solvent exchange. The bulk magnetization is contributed to by three equivalent pro protons, which leads to signal gains. And then methyls also exhibit characteristic chemical shift ranges, which aids in resonance assignment. So if you just look at a, a 2D correlation plot of uh, methyl proton and methyl carbon uh, from chemical shifts from the BMRB for different methyl types on different amino acids, you can really see that these methyls owing to their unique chemical environment like to live in very specific parts of your NMR spectra, which makes it really easy to tell with which, ty uh, which type of methyl that you're working with. There are some potential drawbacks, which are increased sample prep cost, uh, reduced proton chemical shift dispersion, which can lead to uh, cases of significant spectral overlap, but I hope to convince you that the pros of using methyls outweighs the cons. So methyls have uh, very favorable relaxation properties. So they have their own local tumbling time that is different from the backbone atoms. Uh, and you can see this if you just look at order parameters for amides compared to different methyl groups on different amino acids where an order parameter of one corresponds to a more rigid molecule uh, and zero uh, corresponds to a more flexible dynamic group. And as you increase the length of your amino acid side chain where the methyl lives, uh, for example, uh, methionines are quite long, have a quite long side chain, you get more flexible uh, uh, moieties. Um, and there are also differences in the contribution of uh, relaxation mechanisms. So chemical shift anisotropy is not such a big deal for methyl groups as it is for amides, uh, but dipole-dipole interactions is still a, a dominant relaxation mechanism. So uh, methyl labeling is often combined with deuteration, and I'm showing you a really uh, extreme case of why this would be important for a protein that's almost 500 kilodaltons. So if you have a fully protonated sample uh, that's not methyl labeled, 
and you record a, a 2D spectra, the only signals that you get are uh, those coming from a very flexible and disordered uh, uh, termini. Whereas if you uh, deuterate your protein, uh, the backbone in, combina in combination with methyl labeling, you recover a bulk of your signal. And this is because you've reduced a lot of dipole-dipole relaxation from your biprotons. So uh, I'm not going to talk about this in uh, great detail, but methyl uh, trozy is one of the most important things that has been developed uh, for uh, methyl NMR studies of large proteins. Uh, and this was worked on by uh, Vitaly Turgenov and Louis K. Uh, were shown for an 82 kilodalton MSG protein, you get signal enhancement of about two to threefold. Uh, and the difference between uh, the uh, TROZI HMQC versus the HMQC, it's just a couple of different changes in uh, pulses that reduces the mixing of slow and fast relaxation, relaxing components of your methyl spin. And if you look at uh, simulated magnetization from these two experiments for a 650 kilodalton protein, you can really see that when you use the HMQC experiment, uh, your magnetization is a lot more long lived. And if you want to learn more about this, you can read a, a recent review by Schutz and Springer's and Progress of NMR that really goes into uh, the spin physics of this in excruciating detail. Here's a curated list of different large molecules that have been studied by solution NMR, mostly by methyl groups. Uh, and the most impressive of these probably is the proteasome, which was uh, studied by uh, Lewis K's group. And then the ribosome, which is even bigger than that, uh, studied by John Christodoulos group. And this really shows that when you apply uh, all these different techniques, um, that you can really do solution in MR on things that are even bigger than a uh, megadalton, which is kind of crazy to me. So how do you isotopically label your methyl groups? You exploit the biosynthesis pathway of E. coli. Uh, and one method uh, that this was originally done by is by using pyruvate. Uh, which is converted into different amino acids, and you can label your methods that way, methyls that way, but unfortunately you get isotopomers, which degrade your spectral quality. So uh, another approach that was popular, popularized by uh, Kevin Gardner and Lewis K's group is to use labeled glucose in combination with specialized precursors that are added at a specific optical density during your uh, prep. Uh, and the most popular of these is alpha keto isovalerate, which labels your uh, valines and leucines, and alpha keto butyrate, which labels isoleucine uh, delta one. There are a whole bunch of different other flavors of precursors that are used though. Uh, and importantly, you can't just mix and match every single precursor uh, because they can get interconverted, uh, resulting in isotopic scrambling, which you don't want. So here I've summarized in a little bit more detail uh, the typical precursors that are used for methyl labeling. And I, in bold, I've shown the most popular of these schemes, which is uh, MAILV. Uh, where for alanine and methionine, you literally just add uh, the, the labeled amino acids and you, you don't really need a precursor. Um, if anyone's interested in doing these kind of preps, uh, feel free to either contact me and I'll give you a protocol, or you can read either of these reviews that I've shown here. So for leucine and valines, which have uh, two methyl groups, uh, you can uh, label only one of the groups. Um, and that's referred to as pro-S or pro-R labeling. And for really, really large proteins, this helps a lot because for one, it reduces your spectral complexity. So you're, you're reducing the number of leucine and valine methyls by half. You also get uh, modest sensitivity enhancements uh, because you've reduced dipole-dipole relaxation from intramethyl groups. And then this also aids in assignment from an x-ray structure if you have one available because now you've added a stereospecificity. So how do you assign your methyl resonances? So the easiest way to get the ground truth or the actual assignment is by mutagenesis uh, or brute forcing it. Uh, and generally this is done by uh, mutating your uh, residue into either uh, an amino acid that doesn't have a methyl or an, another type of amino acid that has a methyl but the chemical shift range is different. And I'm showing you for a 33 kilodalton protein uh, that I worked on in my PhD. Um, we did this uh, strategy of isoleucine to leucine mutations, and it really, really easy, uh, easily allows you to um, assign your methyl group. Um, and this is even done for a protein that's not deuterated, so it's pretty cool. But if you have 100 methyl groups in your protein, you don't want to do 100 of these experiments. 
So you really, you really got to do uh, other methods. So one of the most commonly common methods used is uh, NOSIs or assignment through space using nuclear overhauser effects, uh, where the NOE magnitude is approximately one over R6 dependent. But for large proteins that have very dense methyl groups, or if you're losing, using very long mixing time in your nosy experiments, you get spin diffusion effects. So this distance dependence isn't exactly like that. Um, I'm showing you an example from my own research for a 95 kilodalton TCR MHC complex, where uh, you're uh, seeing strips from a, a 3D amide to methyl nosy experiment. And we use the x-ray structure to guide our assignment of the methyls from a known backbone assignment. I'm also showing you on the right that for uh, very large proteins that the distance that you can observe these NOEs uh, becomes a lot less. And, but what you can't appreciate from this graph is that for large proteins, the, also, the total number of NOEs also goes down relative to smaller proteins. So to uh, get around that, uh, we've been using fast pulse NMR, specifically so fast NMR experiments that allow for enhanced signal to noise. Here we use very short relaxation delays of uh, 0.2 seconds uh, rather than two seconds, which would normally be used. That allows us to record 3D experiments in eight hours rather than one day without using non-uniform sampling. And we can also uh, observe a greater number of NOEs relative to a reference experiment. Uh, Rosie and Kalodimos have released a, a suite of these SOFAS experiments uh, 15 different experiments of different flavors. Uh, and we, re we really, really like these experiments, specifically the uh, methyl-methyl, amide to amide, and amide to methyl, methyl uh, uh, nosies that you can get. You can also assign uh, through the bond. Uh, and the most popular way to do this is by out and back experiments developed by Vitaly Turgenov and Louis K. Uh, and the approach here is that you linearize your ILV spin system. So you don't send the, send the magnetization down both sides of the branch. That allows you to get uh, uh, sensitivity uh, gains. And they also use cozy type magnetization transfers. Unfortunately, this type of experiment requires that you have the C alpha, C beta, beta, and C O assignments. Uh, but if you have these available, this is a really, really quick and easy way to assign your methyls. So on the right, I'm showing you an example for 95 kilodalton TCR MHC complex, where uh, we've recorded standard H and C A in green, uh, H and C B in red, uh, and then the out and back experiment in black and gray. And when you overlay, overlay these experiments, uh, you get a really nice correlation between the signals, which al allows you to assign the methyls. You, it's a lot of work for a grad student or a postdoc to do this for many, many different proteins that you're studying. Uh, so there's been a lot of pushes into automating your methyl assignments. Uh, and the general idea of doing this is using uh, NOEs uh, from 3D CCH experiments, using short or long mixing times to get different uh, uh, distance restraints. And I'm summarizing the different programs that have been uh, developed to do this. Uh, they're all free except for methylflya, which uh, requires you to buy cyana uh, for quite a price. Uh, and they all, uh, in our experience of using them, they can provide errors and assignments, uh, except for magma and mouse, which was developed by our lab. Unfortunately, magma doesn't run on raw uh, picked NOE data, whereas mouse does. So in our humble, uh, humble opinion, uh, mouse is the best uh, of these programs to use, and we have a web server available. So the general idea of how this is done is you prepare a couple of different samples that are labeled differently. Uh, a normal AILV sample, the ILV uh, linearized system, and then a pro, uh, pro S or pro R labeled sample. Uh, you acquire your 3D experiments and 2D experiments and you input this into mouse together with a, either a solved structure or a model. And mouse uses graph theory and satisfiability to come up with a list of possible assignments. This was work done in collaboration with Sandra D. Nearly and Vivian DePaula in the lab of Nick Tarakis. Uh, and Nick recently gave a really, really nice talk uh, on this system that's available on YouTube for people who want to learn more about this. So methyl groups and dynamics. So dynamics are becoming a lot more popular because people are realizing that they're really, really important for biomolecular function. Uh, so most biomolecules aren't static. 
they move on different time scales. Uh, and the time scale uh, of the movement depends on what kind of movement is happening. Uh, the most common of these for uh, proteins and other uh, biomolecules is either allosteri or domain movements, which occur on microsecond to millisecond time scales. And there's been a whole bunch of different NMR experiments that probe uh, these kind of uh, exchanges based on uh, the time scale. And so you can choose uh, based on what process you want to look at uh, your specific NMR experiment. And for methyl groups, uh, the two most popular of these are CPMG and CES experiments. The basic idea of these is that you have a low energy ground state that you can observe in your NMR uh, spectra. And then you have an excited state which is invisible in your NMR spectra and exists at a lower population and a higher energy. But there's exchange between these two states that happens. Uh, and you can use these two experiments to indirectly probe for the existence of your excited state by monitoring the ground state uh, NMR spectra. Uh, and you do this by acquiring a set of 2D experiments where you modulate a very speci uh, specific parameter based on what experiment you're using. And this allows you to uh, probe the exchange between your uh, ground and excited state. I'll tell you a little bit about CPMG, relaxation dispersion, because I'm going to use it uh, in the second part of my talk. Uh, and the important thing to note is that uh, depending on the exchange rate and the population, uh, you can't just use any of these experiments. It has to be within a specific regime. Uh, but if, if, if it's in this regime, you can obtain uh, cool parameters, such as the population of your ground and excited state, the exchange rate between these two states, uh, and the absolute value of the difference between the chemical shifts for these two states. And in CPMG, what you do is you monitor the uh, relaxation of the transverse plane, which is read out as R2 effective. And you do this by applying a series of 180 degree pulses at different frequencies, which is called the CPMG frequency. You apply these during a relaxation delay in your experiment. And when you apply these CPMG pulses, you quench the exchange between your two states. So in your actual uh, uh, CPMG results, what you get is a, a comparison of R2 effective versus CPMG pulse, where when you don't apply a lot of these pulses, you get a lot of exchange. And as you in increase their CPMG frequency, you've quenched your exchange if the exchange actually exists. Okay, so here's where I break for questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I know I simplified a lot of, a lot of those things. Uh, but <laughs> if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, to the audience, if you have any questions, please post uh, them on the Q&A. Yeah, it looks like um, we don't have any questions uh, yet, but uh, maybe somebody is probably typing in a question, so we will um, wait for a minute or two. If not, I will, I will just go on to... Uh probably the most interesting part. Uh, yeah, somebody posted a question um, in the chat. Um, so the question is, um, how come um, mouse is more precise than other algorithms? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, it's a little complicated, but uh, each of the programs kind of has a different way of uh, approaching the problem. Uh, and the way mouse does this is by basically constructing uh, graphs of every possible uh, combination uh, that could exist. Uh, and we also create an ensemble of structures that we pull from. Um, so Mouse uses very fancy uh, computer algorithms to actually enumerate all possible assignments based on these graphs that it creates from your structures. Uh, and it comes up with lists of assignments. And so um, these other programs other than Magma, Magma has a very similar approach. Uh, they, they don't really uh, construct these all possible assignment graphs. And so that leads to potential errors in your assignment. Um, I think that's the best way I, I can describe it. Maybe, maybe if you watch uh, Nick's lecture on this, you can get a little more, more detail. Um, what's the limit for protein sizes using this method? Uh, well, it depends what 
what what specifically uh, this method means. If you want to use methyls for solution, you can go to two megadaltons. But doing all the as assignment experience experiments at two, two megadaltons won't work. So you kind of have to like make smaller domains that you assign and transfer to your uh, full size proteins. Um, but you can yeah. do very very large proteins up to megadaltons. There's one more question. I don't know if from, that answers uh, that question, Peter. For relaxation dispersion, do you use all three protons in the metals or do you deuterate two of them? Yeah, that's a great question. So for the for the order parameter measurements, typically that's done using uh, deuteration. Um, you deuterate one of the methyl groups. Um, but for CPMG and CES type relaxation experiments, those are normally done where you have uh, have all three protons on your methyl are protonated. Um, but the there are different flavors of CPMG relaxation, uh, single quantum, uh, double quantum, and multiple, qu uh, triple quantum, where you select a specific coherence in that methyl group, depending on your exchange regime and your protein size. Uh, but generally, they're all, they're all protonated. Okay, I guess if there are no more questions uh, for the moment, uh, we could probably go ahead with the rest of your talk. Uh, meanwhile, um, if there are other questions, please do post uh, them in the Q&A box. Thank you. All right, thank you for your questions. Okay. All right, uh, so just a brief overview of the system that we work on in our lab. Uh, we study the adaptive immune system, and uh, one of the major players in this is called the MHC protein. Uh, and what this does is it basically presents uh, the prote proteome uh, to T cell receptors. So if you have a protein in your cell, which is either a self, self protein or a protein from viruses or maybe a cancer protein, this is degraded into peptide fragments. Uh, the peptide fragments are loaded into the endoplasmic reticulum where they associate with the MHC protein. Uh, there are molecular chaperones that aid the process of peptide loading. And then the MHC is trafficked to the cell surface where it's recognized by T cell receptors uh, on T cells. Um, so we're interested in understanding uh, what peptide antigens are important for different diseases. Uh, we're interested in characterizing peptide MHC structures and also understanding the function of the molecular chaperones. So in the first case, uh, I'll tell you about a really interesting peptide that in collaboration with John Maris's group at the Children's Hospital, Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, we found this uh, peptide in neuroblastoma, which is a type of childhood cancer. Uh, and this peptide associates uh, with uh, one of the MHC proteins as shown by fluorescent polarization measurements. Uh, we tried to solve the, crust, uh, the structure by X-ray crystallography. We did very, very, very exhaustive screens and we can never solve the structure. So we thought about approaching this from uh, an NMR uh, standpoint. Uh, and this is work done in collaboration with David Flores Solis and the lab of Nick Sharakis. So because the MHC groove where the peptide uh, binds has a lot of methyls and aromatic groups, we thought about uh, obtaining uh, sparse uh, restraints for peptide MHC docking. So we went ahead and we used these 3D nosy so fast type experiments mm -hmm. to assign uh, the methyls and the aromatic of our 45 kilodalton MHC protein. And then we went to uh, sought out uh, restraints for peptide docking. Uh, and we uh, obtained these using two different type of experiments. One is uh, the so fast uh, nosy experiments. And then the second is a filtered, uh, filtered edited uh, nosy experiment. And we got similar restraints, whether we used uh, either of these two methods where the so fast experiments gave us a lot better signal to noise as expected. Uh, so from these experiments, we got both peptide to MHC restraints and we got MHC to MHC restraints uh, that we use for structure calculations. So using uh, Rosetta flexible peptide docking, uh, we found that we could uh, get a nice uh, quality NMR structure uh, with very low energy uh, compared to the same protocol where we don't provide restraints. Uh, you get kind of a funky peptide docking and very low energy structures, uh, showing that even uh, a small number of NOE restraints can drive this kind of docking. Uh, the peptide confirmations that we obtained uh, follow expected values on the Ramachandran plot. Um, and then 
once we have this peptide MAT structure, we can identify surface features of the peptides that are presented to uh, TCRs. In this case, there's a lysine that is mutated in uh, neuroblastoma cancer that is presented to, on the surface uh, to the TCR. And we also compared the confirmation that we got by solution in MAR with uh, other peptides of the same length bound to the same MHC and found that our confirmation that we got by NMR uh, observes a, a very uh, conserved confirmation with these other peptides uh, that were solved by crystallography. In the second case, I just wanna tell you a little bit about how we do chemical shift mapping for these very large complexes. Uh, this is work done by me in Nick's lab, uh, where I'm showing two cases for uh, a peptide MHC a chaperone complex that's 87 kilodaltons and a TCR MHC complex that's 95 kilodaltons. And these are just uh, proton carbon uh, methyl correlation plots uh, for free and bound states. Uh, I, and I think this is important to show because these samples aren't idealized samples. There are 100 micromole uh, concentration samples. Uh, that are very uh, unstable at room temperature. So we can still do this kind of work even with these kind of uh, samples for large proteins. The way we do this is by doing a, a full titration uh, and doing, doing methyl resonance line shape analysis using Chris Wadby's program called Titan. For anyone doing line shape analysis, I would really recommend this uh, program. It's, it's really great and gives you a lot of cool um, features. The, uh, Interaction surfaces that we defined in solution by methyl NMR uh, match uh, surfaces uh, revealed by independently solved X-ray crystal, uh, crystal structures from David Markelis's group at the NIH, uh, which is really cool. Finally, I'll tell you a little case about uh, looking at dynamics for these proteins. So there are a whole bunch of different MHC protein flavors, uh, different MHC alleles that are diverse within the population. And the chaperone uh, does not interact the same with all these uh, different MHC alleles, as shown here uh, by a case for one MHC that doesn't interact with the chaperone by either NMR or ITC, and uh, another MHC that does interact with the uh, chaperone by both NMR and ITC. So molecular dynamics studies done by us and other groups uh, suggest that the different MHCs have different dynamic profiles. And we hypothesize that the conformational dynamics of the MHC would be important for chaperone recognition. So what we did is we went and we uh, measured CPMG experiments for the interacting allele and the non-interacting MHC allele. And we found that the allele that interacts gives nice dispersion profiles, whereas the one that doesn't interact gives you very flat dispersion profiles, suggesting that in the microsecond to millisecond uh, time scale, the dynamics for these MHCs is quite different. To, to, uh, to provide more evidence that these dynamics are important for uh, chaperone recognition, what we did is take the MHC that displayed these dynamics and tried to reduce them and see how that affects interaction with the chaperone. So the way we did this is by creating the disulfide bond uh, in the peptide binding group of the MHC where the idea is that uh, this disulfide bond would restrict the conformational dynamics of these two helices. So for the wild type protein, we measured uh, uh, interaction with the chaperone and got a KD of, of about 30 micromole. For the mutant protein, uh, which contains the disulfide bond, uh, it abrogates the binding and you get a KD of about 500 micromole. And importantly, this uh, observation is dependent on the formation of the disulfide bond because if you add a weak reducing agent TCEP, you cleave this disulfide bond and you can recover the wild type KD. And then we went back and we recovered, uh, we recorded uh, CPMG experiments on the wild type and the mutant protein. Uh, here I'm just focusing on one methyl probe that is on this helix that uh, an MT simulation moves a lot. And we can show that when you make this uh, disulfide mutation, uh, you uh, quench the CPMG dynamics uh, completely. So you basically removed any microsecond to millisecond timescale dynamics uh, for your mutant protein, uh, providing a lot of evidence that this uh, confirmational exchange is important for chaperone recognition. So uh, just to conclude on where I think methyl labeling is going in the future, uh, to date, pretty much everything is done uh, in E. coli. Um, but uh, for a lot of proteins, they don't like to uh, express an E. coli very well. 
Um, so people are working on alternative expression systems, either cell-free expression, insect cell, uh, yeast and human cells, and then also move, moving on to in-cell NMR. So I think these are gonna be more popular in the future. I think there's gonna be uh, progress in automated assignment where uh, new methods or uh, new types of NMR experiments recorded and implemented in these programs will be helpful. Uh, I think a new chemical shift prediction methods going from uh, X-ray to uh, methyl chemical shift or vice, vice versa will be important. And then uh, methyl NMR of other biomolecules. So there was a recent paper by Lewis's K, Lewis K's group where they methylated uh, nucleic acid and did NMR in complex with the nucleosome, which I think is super cool. And then of course, new mythologies and full sequences are being developed over time. Uh, so just to thank, uh, to thank Nick, who's an, uh, who helped a lot with uh, all of these, uh, these projects. And the work uh, of Mouse was done by Vivian and Santrupi in our lab. And then a former postdoc, David uh, Flores Solis, helped with the uh, docking studies. So thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, fantastic talk. Um, I had uh, one question after looking at some of the um, molecular docking, uh, peptide docking data that you shared. Um, so are you also able to extract some uh, kinetic information or, um, or possibly say something about the strength of the binding from the NMR data? Because I know from the nosy data, you're getting those distance restraints, which you're then putting, it, putting into the molecular docking, right? But are you, can you actually say something about the strength of the binding from the NMR itself? Yeah, so we, we, we didn't measure strength of the binding by NMR. Uh, if you, we, you might be able to, um, we, we haven't looked at that. Uh, maybe you could do ZZ exchange type experiments to look for that. Um, we did measure the exchange uh, by fluorescent polarization, uh, and the KD of this peptide is kind of in the mid micromole range. Um, so presumably the peptide is coming off and on. Uh, maybe that's why crystallization didn't work, uh, but uh, it stays on long enough that we can actually get nice NOEs, so it can't be so bad. Yeah, I don't know. If, does that answer your question? No, it does. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, and as we start to get more questions, probably we could answer some of these. So Shivangi has a question. Can other biomolecules such as say DNA be methylated and studied in a similar way? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mentioned that uh, the paper that you would want to read here is this Abernov paper in PNAS, which was just published. Um, it's, they, they had to develop this entire system uh, to start with a, a precursor and then use me, uh, enzymes to actually methylate your DNA and then perform NMR on it. So it's very, it was very complex to do this, uh, but you can do this. And I, I think it's, it's, there, there are going to be a lot of new methods that are developed for, for using this kind of approach for, for, for DNA and RNA. Yeah. All right. Um, Let's see, how the do you decide if a CPMG yeah. curve is flat or not? Yeah, so uh, the, this is a great question. Um, the field kind of came on that, let's see if I can go back to uh, a curve. Um, the field kind of had the standard is that if your R2 effective mm -hmm. is greater than one, it, it's considered a CPMG curve. I think in reality, I, I think that's a very low number. Um, but that, that's what people use. If it's if the R2 effective, the, the, the change between the uh, zero and whatever large CPMG frequency you use is at least one, then it could be considered effective. Uh, if you're seeing that your CPMG curves are very flat across, either that means that you don't have uh, exchange in this time scale, or that uh, you're kind of outside of the regime of the type of CPMG you're using. So if you switch from a single quantum experiment to a triple quantum experiment, the difference in the R2 uh, effective will be larger. Uh, and so it might be more significant. Um, so, but that's a great question. The next question is from another anonymous attendee. How do you deal with buffer or detergent signals in the methyl range? That's good, uh, a good question. Normally, we we are typically using like 100 millimolar salts and sodium phosphate. If you use Tris, you'll 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 get some signal unless it's deuterated. Um, the SOFAS experiments are a little bit worse at 
uh, at getting rid of these uh, types of signals, but if you're using other non-SOFAST type HMQC experiments, you may be able to add like a, a soft pulse or something to selectively get rid of these, uh, these uh, solvent effects. But generally we, we don't like to put things in the, in the solution to begin with, unless you need to. Uh, stuff like glycerol you might need, you can deuterate, uh, so you don't get as much of a signal, um, but generally we like to stay away from that kind of stuff. The next question is from Ricarda. How do you deal with line shape broadening due to the size of the interaction partners when, when doing line shape analysis with Titan? Yeah, so Titan will actually go in and look at the R2, uh, the, the, the relaxed station uh, that it measures uh, by, by half the line width, and it actually corrects for this automatically in the program, so it's kind of cool. All right. The next question is from uh, an anonymous attendee. Why do people only show CPMG curves for residues that have dispersion? What about the rest of the protein? Uh, yeah, yeah. So generally, at least when I like to show this data, I show all the methyls in the protein. And I, for each of the methyls, I will show which one has a chemical uh, exchange by CPMG. Uh, in a certain color based on the scale of the, um, uh, the delta omega. Uh, and then the ones that don't have dispersion, I like to show on a structure that they don't have dispersion by color than black or gray or something. But yes, you're, you're right. And a lot of these uh, papers, they only focus on the ones that have dispersion and they're just like, they occur on a specific surface and then everything else doesn't have dispersion. That's kind of how they classify it. Um, I think maybe it could help to actually show more readily which ones don't have dispersion too. Yeah. But usually um, they, they, they normally correlate on a specific surface, um, depending on the, the process. Uh, the only case where you don't have that is if there's some kind of allosteric uh, network or communication, and then you'll see residues that have dispersion in the, in the core of the protein as there's a dynamic process going through the protein. All right. The next question um, is, how much do you have to invest extra for metal labeling in addition to 15 and 13 C and uh, deuterated sample for a one liter culture? Yeah. Um, so the highest cost when you're doing these kind of preps is uh, the D2O, so which is about uh, $300 for one liter of D2O. The D2O you can recycle and use a couple of times, but it's not infinite. Uh, and then also the uh, deuterated glucose is quite expensive. So I think the total cost for uh, a standard prep uh, is about um, in the range of five times more expensive than your uh, corresponding normal N15 prep and water. So it's expensive, um, but you, you, you get what you pay for. <laughs> 